Good evening, everyone. Um, let me start off. We're going to have a, a discussion, and we've got a very distinguished guest here tonight, um, an eminent professor from uh, Imperial, uh, David Hand, who uh, previously held the chair in statistics, uh, a mathematician who's twice been president of the Royal Statistical Society, and is currently uh, the chief scientific advisor to Winton Capital Management. Um, some of you will know uh, that amazing business. And um, David has written uh, a fantastic book, I can probably give you a plug, <laughs> spare your blushes David, uh, called The Improbability Principle, which um, is well worth reading if you haven't read it. If, if you ever wondered, if you were living in Sydney and um, gave all your books away to a charity shop um, and moved to London and 20 years later went into a second-hand bookshop and, and picked a book off the shelf and found it was one of the ones you um, donated to the charity in Sydney. If you ever wondered the chances of that and, and, and how those sort of um, probabilities work through, uh, read David's book because um, there's some extraordinary um, insightful views on, on that. Um, David, do you want to come and join me because um, I'm putting you on the spot here. You, have, <laughs> you have to rehearse jumping onto here. It's a health and safety thing. So uh, what, what I thought we would do just for the, the 10 or 15 minutes, and if we keep our discussion to 10 minutes and you've got questions, um, as long as they're for David, I don't mind. <laughs> I'll, I'll choreograph them through. Uh, let, let's start off um, machine learning. And uh, th I'm starting with a presumption that machine learning means something to all of you in the room, knowing that you come from um, a, an industry that I is uh, up to speed in this area. And there are different definitions, so let's not get held up on, on that. David, how is machine learning uh, currently affecting financial services? How, how do we get our, our minds into, into that? Yeah, it's an interesting question because of your use of the word currently. In fact, if you look back at, at the history of the applications of computers in the financial sector, you see, in fact, it goes back a long way. I mean, certainly in the 50s, people started to develop computer algorithms for scorecards in retail credit scoring, for instance. So there is, in fact, a long history of, and those were essentially machine learning methods, a long history of these methods being developed. Of course, currently, we're, we're hitting a, a time when it's all, you know, the media have really picked up on it, and there's a lot of media hype about it. But, of course, it's driven by increasingly powerful computers so that there are greater and greater opportunities. So I think the short answer is going to have a big impact across the board of the financial sector, from the retail sector through insurance to financial trading, wherever. I I w give us a, some insights on the sort of things that people are starting to do um, with these powerful tools okay. uh, and algorithms. I regard machine learning this is perhaps a little bit controversial. I regard machine learning as a subdiscipline of statistics. Statistics is all about squeezing illumination and understanding from data. Machine learning is about that with a particular kind of objective right. in mind. Machine learning is usually about predicting something, so it's a subclass of statistics. So that, in short, is the way it's, it's changing things. It's allowing superior predictions. And it's not just based on more powerful computers with bigger memory, which can do things faster. It's also based on, and I think this is important, new kinds of data. And the particularly important thing, I think, is automatic data capture. In the old days, you wanted to capture some data, you'd go around with a clipboard, or, or you, you'd you know, measure something with a ruler, or whatever it was. Nowadays, you have electronic sensors, which are automatically measuring things in the real world, monitoring credit, credit card transactions, purchases in a supermarket. The data are automatically captured, coming into the giant databases, which can then so, be... So that level of automation uh, and, and the possibilities for automation, mm -hmm. we can see, and you've given us some examples of, um, we can see potentially a huge amount more of that happening um, so, yeah. in everywhere where transactions take place, where money is stored, where value is stored. Yeah. Um, we'll see it affecting every type of player in financial services? I, I think we will. First, there's the opportunities, the sort of thing I've described, but there's also the sort of economic driver. Um, last year, there were, what was it, 600,000 startups in the UK, a phenomenal number of startups in, in the UK. Um, and I think, you know, people are, especially people coming out of universities with, with degrees in particular subjects, PhDs in machine learning, so on, are realising that there is potential. They read about 
something that has just been described, uh, a startup being sold to Google for vast sums of money, and they think, well, I could do that using the fact that I've just done a PhD in deep learning or whatever it happens to be. So I think there's an economic driver here as well. And uh, yeah, you, you talked about predictability. How far can we predict? I mean, can we predict rental prices in housing in various areas of London? Yeah, we I can mean, do. This, this, is, this is an interesting question because... Um, if you've got large data sets, and your question sort of related to the retail credit sector, for instance, in particular, where you've got massive data sets, billions of transactions a year, um, when you've got data sets of that size, lots and lots of observations, lots and lots of different variables measured on these things, then you can make very good predictive models. So you can get accurate models. And how much do you have to manage the... Um, the model, um, you know, the, 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 there's an election coming up, government changes, economic policy changes. How far does your model get twisted out of shape? Yeah. Um, and do you have to start from scratch or, or do you have the kernel that will continue and, you know, you yeah. can reset it for rental prices in December? Oh, well, you, you can build the kind of model will be common or could be common and you could adapt it. But I think, again, you've put your finger on, on something which is absolutely crucial there. And this is that there's what I regard as the issue of data quality. Data aren't always as perfect as you think. And there's often, in particular, an area I'm especially interested in, issues of selection bias. There are subtle distortions, and I can illustrate this in the retail credit sector. We might be trying to build a model which will predict whether people will be, whether they'll default on a loan, for instance. So we'll, what we do is we'll look back at past data. We'll look at the descriptors of people, what they put on application forms, how they've behaved with previous credit lines in the past and we'll look at whether they defaulted or not and we can build a model based on that but of course what we want to do is build a model for anybody who might apply the whole population of future applicants the data that we're building the model on in the past is obviously only those people that we thought would be good in the past those are the only ones we accepted so we've got a distorted a biased a selected data set and those sorts of issues are pervasive throughout throughout fintech, throughout, throughout data analysis. You've got to be really aware of them, or, or there are risks that your model so, could go so, wrong. So my question about the, the effort that's taken um, uh, and who does it, uh, you, you used the word automation and, and automated data capture earlier on. Um, are we seeing this technology displacing jobs, and are we seeing it requiring different types of capabilities? I, I mean, I guess the answer is yes and yes, but can you give some dimensions or some, yeah. some sort of trend lines and, yeah. uh, and view on that? I mean, this, this is the concern, isn't it, that we keep reading in the newspapers that jobs are being automated away. People aren't, you know, the computer's going to take over from lawyers. Probably a good thing. I don't know. But, um, <laughs> but How many lawyers <laughs> yeah, here? <laughs> <laughs> we'll have a, an evening on law tech at some point. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> But this is, this is the concern. But of course, if you look back in history, there have been similar concerns, Industrial Revolution and other sort of automatic sort of revolutions in the past. And the, the fears have never materialised because the nature of the jobs have, has shifted around. That doesn't mean it won't happen this time, mm. but, you know, the track record shows that things just change rather than the, the jobs, rather than jobs in general evaporating having an interesting conversation before we started about what we do about that as a society. It's a bigger question than one just of financial services, but um, uh, you may or may not know that uh, back in the medieval period, um, when bridge builders, I'm a civil engineer, and when bridge builders started building bridges across the Thames, it was displacing um, watermen and lightermen who used to row you across the Thames. And the worshipful company of fishmongers cut a very tough deal um, that meant there was a tax on bridges, uh, a tax on the technology, if you like, of crossing the river uh, because it was displacing jobs. And when they built the Wobbly Bridge, the Millennium Bridge, um, in 2000, that bridge was taxed because that law still exists. Yeah. And the money went to the worshipful company of fishmongers to make up for the loss of earnings <laughs> of people rowing. <laughs> Are we going to see... <laughs> Here's the big question. Are we going to see a tax on the algorithms? Or attacks on the on there, the bots. There, there have been suggestions that that should be done. That 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 the algorithms should in fact pay. And and of course you you've all read of the possibility of a 
a standard wage that everybody gets, whether they're working or not across the board. So that is a possibility. So it's something could have been figured out there, maybe. Yeah, yeah. I think we're, we're sort of we're drifting into that. We're, we're moving away from fintech very much into the realm of the social sciences and so on here. And, uh, so let's go back to fintech. And uh, perhaps the last question, and I'll then see if invite anyone else who'd like to, to ask you, David, a, a question. Um, can we trust uh, what's happening with machine learning? Do, uh, what, what, what does it mean for the relationship between us sort of humble users and people with bank accounts or businesses that are, are transacting um, with uh, this predictive capability and the machine learning capability okay. in the middle of it? So, so my basic perspective is that the algorithms are superior to humans in terms of the judgments that they make. And you can see this in medicine as well, the medical diagnostic systems. Um, but there is always this qualification. It will, de it will depend upon the data set not being distorted and, and, and those sorts of things. So I think and what's happened in medicine is that doctors don't like to rely solely on the um, judgment, the recommendation of, the, of an algorithm, but like to use that as a second opinion. Mm. So we might move in that direction. But it depends on the particular application area. Obviously in financial trading, the markets increasingly drive towards algorithms in the retail credit sector with credit scorecards. That's totally dominated mm. now by automation and algorithms. Um, insurance increasingly dominated. So, yeah. right. Great. Thanks, David. We've got a couple of minutes. Does anyone have a... Sp yes, please. Do you want to say where you come from as well? Yeah, sure. I'm Carly. I'm a journalist with H Fund Technology, so I cover technology and data science and hedge funds. Um, and um, I'm interested in the prospects of automatic uh, data capture, but actually more specifically um, whether there's a prospect to develop um, automatic uh, data management, so cleaning and normalizing and structuring, uh, yes, yes. because that's something that you know, people I speak to say is it really takes way too much kind of human power. That's absolutely right. I mean, there's an old statistical joke that, that you know, 90% of the effort is on cleaning the data and then 10% is the fun model building sort of thing. Um, I think aspects of data cleaning will be automated and automatable. Um, once you know there's a particular kind of problem, then you can develop an algorithm which will, will uh, uh, seek to cater for it. But... I can quote Tolstoy, can't I? Uh, a data set can be right in one way, but it can be wrong. He didn't talk about data, he talked about ha happy families and so on, but it can be wrong in an, an unlimited number of ways. So there will always be data quality issues that we haven't thought of or haven't seen before, and so you've not completely yeah. automated all. Yeah. You have to really understand what you have before you start. Yeah. 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 yeah, I mean, uh, my name is Satish. I'm kind of uh, running, kind of doing a startup called FinSol. One of the problem again, you touched upon it, is the quality of the data yeah, and yeah. the actuals around the data, right? If you think about even the, the CPI index or the whole kind of inflation index is yeah. based around so much data which is not relevant. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yet, right? Uh, you would think the government would make more automations and machine learning around that to make it more predictable. Yeah. But ironically, it isn't. So what we are trying yeah. to do is try to get the actual transparency around it. Yeah. What do you think? I mean, if we just annotate the data, right? If every data gets semantics error, then it becomes easy to cleanse. The current problem we have is the model is not yeah. descriptive on its own. Yeah. Data no, I, I think that's absolutely right. And data are not just numbers. Data are numbers and the metadata around the numbers, what the numbers actually mean <coughs> and so on. And the metadata and manipulating the metadata is just as important as manipulating the numbers. Incidentally, um, the Office for National Statistics has just set up this new data science campus down in Newport where they are trying to, they're exploring capturing alternative sorts of data for use in constructing other inflation indices and so on. So. Yeah, I think we'll take this as the last one and we, we can have further discussion afterwards, but let's, yes sir. Yeah, um, it's more of a sort of question. What do you define the difference between artificial intelligence and machine learning? Yeah, I, I suppose... Machine learning is a specific kind of, uh, particular kind of objective. Usually when you're actually trying to predict something, AI might be, uh, uh, more, might be broader. It might be natural language understanding and, and include other things as well. That would be my definition. I suspect that every researcher you talk to will have slightly different definitions. Yeah.
<laughs> well, that, that might be, thank you, David, that might be a good cue for us to move on to Alessandra. So let's give uh, David thanks for giving us a start off with those nice